If you missed Wednesday's video, then you missed part one of our Stanford adventure. Wilderness Road Hospitality sponsored this trip so we could get the full Stanford experience. We stayed in the Little Red House on the corner, aka Whitley Cottage, and enjoyed dinner our first night at Bluebird. Day two in Stanford started with a tour of the train depot and Boffman Mill. Garland gave us a lot of the history behind each of them. The train depot was actually restored in the 90s, and since then has been serving as a public meeting place. It holds everything from family reunions to business meetings. We scraped down paint to the edges and ground it up and did a lot of uh, try and research and, and, and came up with a, a really good color scheme that's very close to the official L&N uh, colors uh, of the original building. So President Roosevelt did a uh, uh, train stop here and the train stopped somewhere along the railroad track right here. Uh -huh. And, uh, and of course, the newspapers describe all of that, you know, the history of it. And I think that's some of what's in the, but I mean, it was just a quick whistle stop, as they said back in the 40s. Right. Or maybe this was, yeah, I think it was for his second term. And uh, anyway, so we got some Roosevelt dimes that we've gotten in the top of the curb there, I think. But I, I, sometimes I can't find them. I, I don't know if I did one or two or whatever, but it's on the center of the railroad track. Oh, really? Just put these little Roosevelt dimes into the concrete. Before we continue, here's a little bit more about our tour guide Garland and what he does when he's not giving incredible tours of the train depot and mill. I grew up in the neighboring county in Rock Castle County. So, you know, our local history has been something other that's really been important to all of us. And uh, we've just had a golden opportunity to be involved in sort of recreating and, and bringing the history back and bringing the, the town back to uh, and, you know, the look with uh, the turn of the century architecture. I call myself a little bit of a country architect. Uh, and uh, so, but Mayberry, they, they didn't have, uh, the Andy Griffin Show didn't have an architect in their <laughs> little staff, but, but we have one here. So it's, pretty, it's been a lot of fun. Our, uh, our church, our church is, was founded in, in the uh, early, early 1800s. And there's been an architect, as I understand it, there's been an architect in the congregation ever since the, the original church was founded. And uh, when we moved to town, one of the elderly guys, uh, Mr. Reed was, uh, you know, the architect uh, of, the, of the town. And he had done a lot of, he did like the clerk, the library and the clerk's building. And, and um, so anyway, he was, he was like, well, here you, You've come to you've come to sort of help me out, you know. <laughs> Next up was the Boffman Mill, one of the oldest in Kentucky. But we'll let Garland tell you more about that. My mother used to own this building. She bought it from the, the Boffman family, and she had her upholstery shop, and she she had big quilting machines and whatever else that's set up in this real room. It basically operated as a feed mill and, and a, a milling, you know, and feed mill until 1968, I think. And then the Boffman, uh, Mr. Boffman and he, his, uh, I guess his brother, they ended up, they had a little office in here, this little real estate office. Now it's just kind of waiting for someone to come back and live here and dreaming of what the possibilities would be. I've done some, I've done some renderings of, of an, another piece of building over there that'd be like a stair tower that would look like a grain bin. We refloored everything with this tobacco warehouse flooring. And you see these spots in the, in the tobacco warehouses, you know, like over in Danville and up in Lexington or whatever, you know, they'd have all these things striped off. So that you, you know, your bundles of tobacco would come and set right. behind these lines and they would walk along well. The lines, we, we just left everything as it is. There were a couple of kids that asked me to uh, let them get access for a prom picture. Okay. <laughs> it was insane. And then all of a sudden, it was like just within, you know, just within a few minutes, that there was, there was cars, there were cars lined up everywhere. And these people going, oh, can we, you know, you know, so, and it was, you know, it was like, it was just funny. I would love to have my architect's office right here. I just, it, it, it's a really pretty space. Well, all of the belting, 
and you can see these big, these big turning, uh, these wheels, right. all right? There's all this big, huge series of belts and, and machinery that turn. And these little, these little rods put tension, they could put tension on the different, they, they, the, they'd like on this, they'd stand on this platform and he'd operate those little rods and he could put tension on wherever he wanted these wheels to spin and grind and whatever, you know. Here, there was a, a bin that had different degrees of grinding in it. So it was all broke up into different bins, but these are all places where that little wooden chutes went through the floor out of this big bin. So as they were grinding and, and making the mill, you can see, you can still see how it says that, you, you know, the biscuit company or whatever here. You know, the, the trains would pull up. The main tracks, the main tracks were over there where the sidewalk is. Uh -huh. But there were spurs that came through here that then, you know, the train would get here and, and send the grain up, drop it into these buckets, and then it would come and, and get dispersed uh, to start the grinding process from all the way up the top. So one of the things with the Heritage Council, you know, when we were doing the restoration work, certainly the Heritage Council didn't want us to, they didn't, you're, you're really not supposed to add a lot of features that were not originally part of the buildings and so on. But I, we just couldn't resist this. And so we had these, uh, these are German, these were German made skylights. After our two awesome tours, it was time to get our relaxation on at Esther's Wellhouse. It's a full service spa with the most incredible atmosphere. It doesn't feel pretentious, it feels healing. It's warm and inviting, and that exposed brick? Come on y'all, you know we're suckers for that. Joni B had an incredible massage from Amy. It was so good she came out crying because of how much better she felt. I had a facial from Miss Wendy and it was the best I've ever had. She was so gentle and kind, and I don't know about you, but when I go get a spa treatment done, it feels very vulnerable. You're exposed in more ways than one. But Wendy and Amy didn't make us feel insecure or less than for a second. We felt so, so good. Here's one of my favorite moments I had with Wendy. The facial had just begun and I was already thinking of all the things she would notice that were wrong or messed up with my skin and me in general. This should give you an idea of who these people are. The eyebrows are atrocious, but they will be getting fixed as soon as we get over the strip. <laughs> they are not. I promised you they're not. You're not allowed to think like that either. You're not allowed to think, oh, she's looking at this, she's looking at that, because I promise you I'm not. After our time at Esther's Well House, we were able to sit down with Jim Rousey, the president of University Guarantee Life and CEO of First Southern Bank Corp. He also works closely with Jesse Carell and his wife Angela, the ones who've had the vision for Stanford's incredible revitalization. Since the Carells were on their way back from Italy, Jim gave us a look inside their mission. You know, they just, over time, through a lot of studying and thinking about things, um, realized that there were things like how you're honoring the labor of people who did this labor years ago, and why we think it's more important to restore old buildings as opposed to tear them down and build new ones. Uh, I really credit them with the vision. I think you ate the bluebird last mm -hmm. evening at Chef Bill. And, um, did you have breakfast there this morning? No, we didn't. Okay. Um, but, you know, when you go into the bluebird, we've had many people that just sit there that have come to visit and they'll go, wow, this is kind of like some place you might see in Atlanta or Chicago. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's really kind of been their vision to kind of bring the world here. Angela Carell just did a phenomenal job in the decorations and, you know, she really paid a lot of attention, did a lot of homework in her travels. I mean, she would look at bedding and pull it up and say, okay, where'd that come from? And I don't like that one, but I like that mm -hmm. one. And, and, you know, she has a certain uh, vision and she sticks to it, um, you know, from the oil paintings that are original, and most of them are Kentucky artists uh, that she's stuck to, and, and yet creating places where you just feel like you're at home. Mm -hmm. You know, you're happy to go and sit at the house and put your feet up and read a book or turn on the fireplace and just, just rest. 
you know. So how long have you been doing the hospitality part? The restaurant opened, I think, what, eight or nine years ago. And that was kind of a, somewhere in there is kind of when we did some of the first houses. And then what we're doing, we're just on a journey. We're not trying to do it all at once. We're trying to do it right as we go. In 1991, Jess Carell and his partners formed the River Foundation. The goal was to inspire biblical generosity and send the gospel and needed resources to places that needed it. Many of that has gone to help children and youth in Ethiopia and India. We'll have more information on that linked below. It's really cool to sit here and work at a company in Stanford, Kentucky. And because of what we do through the River Foundation, and you, you know, and to think that there's a school in India with over 2,000 kids, and a lot of them are Muslim going to this Christian school where the kids are getting in the middle of, of a slum. That basically, and most of that money came from Jess and Angela and his son. That was their vision. And this lady over there, that if you ever meet her, her name's Amethi, it's, it's like meeting Mother Teresa, started on the front porch of her school on the front porch of her house with two kids and grew immediately like to a hundred and this porch was not as big as this room and she was an educator and started teaching it. but you know to think that money what we're doing what we earn is going and supporting that or in Ethiopia uh, or Springfield Illinois where I just came from you know there's a ministry there that that uh, there's a lot of women and kids who are trying to get away from abusive situations and they have enough money just to get on a train or a bus. They end up in, out of Chicago or Indy, mm -hmm. and they end up in Springfield, Illinois. And they get on, they have nowhere to go. And there's a ministry there that picks them up, takes them, you know, puts them in a room, feeds them, lets the kids feel secure, safe, the women. And then they work with them to either get them on if they're trying to go somewhere else and they're out of money. They help them get somewhere to see family or... Some of them stay there for several months, go through a lot of training, job training and stuff. And some of them have actually stayed long term in Illinois and Springfield. Some of them have moved on to other places. But just to know that as the weather gets really cold, that we're able to help support things. And, and I'm just named two or three, but there's to think that every day, you know, what we do is have an impact on people that we don't even know in a really powerful way. That's really what it's all about. Tell a little bit about the story. Can you read what's down in there? <gasps> wow. Oh, wow. Really? Yeah. So, down below here, you'll see LBJ Ranch and some things. So, there's a guy by the name of Barney Hewlett, who was the pilot of what was then called Army One, which is now called Marine One. And he flew Johnson primarily, but he flew, I think, for five different presidents at different times. And when Lyndon Johnson got ready to go to the farm, he took Barney and his wife with him down to Texas. And so a few years ago, Jess was, and Angel were down there traveling. They loved to travel too. And they were at the LBJ ranch and he saw the name Hewlett. Angel's maiden name was Hewlett. Now as only Jess would do, he found the guy's phone number, called their house. He wasn't there. His wife answered the phone and said, well, he's gone. He won't be back for a while. So a little while Jess called back. Well, he's still not here. Jess being the persistent person, he calls on the third time and Barney gets on the phone. He goes, yeah, come on over, I'd love to meet you. And Libby was kind of a little bit upset thinking, who is these people you've invited to come to our house? <laughs> they ended up becoming great friends and Barney just passed away about four or five months ago. Oh. But anyway, he, uh, he's he got great LBJ stories and uh, anyway, he gave that to Jess one day as a gift. And then some of the other hats, that hat belonged to Jess's brother who passed away at 38 years old uh, as a, a brain cancer. Uh, he and Jess were 50-50 partners on everything. After talking with Jim, we had two more historical sites to visit. First was the William Whitley House. We weren't able to film inside, but here's a little gist of what it's all about. William Whitley built the house as a fortress against Indian attacks in the late 1780s. Although his wife Esther was an acclaimed sharpshooter, protection for their family was important. So this incredible brick house became that safety and protection. A few of our favorite parts. The kitchen was built with a fault ceiling that had a tiny space where the youngest of the 11 children could hide in the event of an attack. The windows were designed for the perfect vantage points and protection. And the chimneys were actually attached on the inside instead of the outside. So Native Americans or other attackers couldn't climb up the house. The Whitleys thought of everything. 
And at a time where many families lost children, the Whitleys had 11 and they all made it to adulthood. Our next stop was to Logan's Fort. It was built in 1775 by Benjamin Logan and John Floyd as a refuge for families coming west. It was positioned within close proximity to a spring so that the men could dig a tunnel that led to the fresh water source. This ensured that even under full siege and lockdown, they would still have access to water. This ensured those on the fort suffered less deaths and diseases than those trapped in other areas. In 1777, the fort was actually held by Native Americans for 13 days. During that time, one of the people staying at the fort, Burr Harrison, was wounded. Benjamin Logan, the founder of the fort, rescued Burr while protecting himself from Native American arrows with a feather mattress. Kind of remarkable to think about, isn't it? By the 1790s, Native American attacks were limited, so the fort wasn't needed. It's now being restored for events and reenactments. We finished our second night at our little red house watching Hallmark Christmas movies. Then the next day, it was all about Kentucky soaps and such. It's an incredible local business that makes all of their products in-house. Seriously, all of it. The soap is poured, cut, and packaged in the basement. What we start with is our oil blend, um, which is mixed in this container and we hold it there. Um, we use sustainable palm oil, coconut and olive, and we put it in there to a ratio by weight. And then in this vat, we keep our lye and rainwater. Now we do catch our water for our soap in this barrel outside. So we don't even use tap water. So what we'll do is we'll mix it by weight into this pan here, pot, kettle, cauldron, it's Halloween. <laughs> uh, we'll mix it here and we start mixing that um, lye rainwater oil mixture until it comes to a nice consistency, comes together well. And then we'll take out three gallons of goat's milk. Now we get our goat's milk from a farmer right up the road here. Mm -hmm. He brings it to us frozen in gallon jugs. Mm -hmm. So we'll let it come just kind of slushy. Mm -hmm. uh, we want it to be as cold as possible and still pour. So we'll put three gallons in, mix it till it comes to the consistency of kind of a thick pancake batter. Okay. And then we're gonna add our ingredients that differentiates that. So with our honey oatmeal, which is our best seller. We use only pure Kentucky honey, no preservatives, nothing like that. So we'll put our essential oils, our fragrance oils in some of them. Um, with our chef's blend, which is a very popular, we actually put coffee in it. And our coffee comes from a roaster down in Pulaski County, Baxter's Coffee. So again, we use the same thing you would use in your own kitchen. So we're gonna mix that up till it gets nice and thick, and then we pour it into a mold here. And we have three of these molds, so when we make soap, we generally make three batches at a time. Um, and this mold right here will make about 350 bars of soap. Oh. So what we're gonna do is pour it in here. It's gonna set for five days. And it's during that time that the chemical process, the chemical reaction between the fats in the goat's milk and the lye. It's called saponification. It's what gives it the lather. And by the time those five days are over, that lye is no longer a threat to you. So um, we will hold it in there and then we take it around to where we will cut it. So usually at day five we're cutting. So what we're gonna do uh, next is we're gonna lift that mold up here and we knock the sides off. And the bottom of it is actually the first plate for our cutting. And it's gonna look like this. And it is still soft enough that you can leave fingerprints in it, but it is stable enough that we can cut it. Mm -hmm. So we put it back under here and we use this cutting tool here and we cut it into logs. We'll move the logs off onto one of our tables lined with paper, pull it back out, take everything off, and then we put this piece in and it does have a different cutting die in there. And we stack the logs back on there and we come back down with this different piece on here. And that's what makes our bars. So when we take the bars off, we put them on long trays with holes in the bottom. And I will show you those in the drying room. We put those on there and they will sit on there for six weeks. And that gets it, gives us the chance for it to get hard enough that we can handle it without squeezing it. Mm -hmm. And then that's when we box it and we do box every piece by hand. 
So we we buy the boxes and we have to pop the boxes together and the whole deal. So wow. everything you see here with Plainview Farm, one of us has made. In the beginning, uh, what started this is Angela had goats on the farm. And of course, Jess is a businessman and a farmer. You don't live for free. You know, mm -hmm. if you don't work, you don't eat that kind of mentality, yeah. you know. But uh, he said, you know, let's do something with these goats because you, you've got to milk them. And so Angela and her niece, Leanne, decided they'd try their hand at goat's milk soap. So in 2003, they had their first successful batch. And Angela began to sell it from her office across the street in the First Southern Building. And uh, in 2006, it was decided, let's try it. Let's open it up, mm -hmm. you know. So uh, she started out in the side of the building over there you guys haven't seen yet, where mm -hmm. the pottery and things like that are. And in 2010, knocked that doorway through and expanded into this side. As you can see from the packaging, it was made sometime between 2007 and 2010. Now, we don't even make this fragrance anymore, but that bar of soap, you can go to the sink and use it today. And you can see it looks fine. Mm -hmm. It takes six weeks to make a batch of bars. So they keep as many on hand as possible, which is why you see this massive supply. With the, the, when we make the logs, mm -hmm. we always get a little skinny piece off the back that wants to roll. Right. So we roll it up. Then they sell those rolls upstairs, often at a discount. With smaller bars, they'll donate those to shelters or to churches as part of hygiene packets for those in need. They say the mission is all about giving. So we don't buy this and put a label on it. We melt it. We pour it into the mold. This is probably our most labor intensive product mm -hmm. because we, you know, you've got to pour it, scrape, pour it, scrape, mm -hmm. take it out, put the lid on, put the label on, put the stretch film on, then, you know. And y'all, I have come to a very serious conclusion. That lip balm, the lip balm from Kentucky Soaps and such is the best, the best ever. No questions asked. I am obsessed. We spent quite a while on Kentucky Soaps and such, picking up some awesome things. Not to mention, they left us a gift basket in our little red house, so we have all the goodies we could want. And poof, just like that, our time in Stanford was over. We had a great time, y'all, and know you will too. So if you're looking for a great low-key vacation with great shopping, history, lodging, and food, don't write off tiny Stanford, Kentucky. We fell in love with the people and the town itself. It's undeniably filled with love, peace, a sprinkle of Southern charm, and a lot of faith. Wilderness Road Hospitality has done a wonderful job revitalizing the town, and they're not done yet. Thank you so much to Wilderness Road Hospitality for sponsoring this trip and allowing us to truly experience Stanford. It won't be our last visit, and we'll be talking about this trip for years to come. If you want to see more videos like this, subscribe. It doesn't cost you nothing to hit that button, y'all.